Uh, for now, I think I should invite the next speaker. Uh, I think the, your brilliant presentation, Philip, you ended in a nice a note that is excellent entry point for the next one. You spoke about the very, very importance of changing mindsets. And we are now on to this session on perceptions of all the people in the society and the media. And please, Nalaka, can you, may I invite you? We were thinking of someone from Asia to speak on this subject. Uh, and uh, then you could not identify someone other than Nalaka, who has also worked with HelpAge, uh, well, before about 10 years now. It's about 10 years that you work together on media uh, and uh, uh, aging and development and media. That subject we worked on for some time earlier on. Uh, Nalaka, you will have the biodata in the little booklet. He's a journalist and a communicator. He has been working in the field of development communication for over two decades. And he's the founder of, a, of an international organization, a co-founder of the Television Trust for the Environment. And now he's the executive director of the Television Trust for the Environment in, Asia, in the Asia Pacific. He writes, he writes extensively, uh, journals, uh, books, uh, and he's involved with a number of uh, 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 broadcasting organizations, uh, BBC, the Canadian, uh, uh, the Canadian CBC, said, and Singapore's Channel News Asia, Swiss TV, etc. And he has worked as a consultant for a number of international organizations, the UNSCAP, uh, UNDP, uh, UNEP, and uh, uh, and ADB. Uh, and thank you, uh, Nalaka, for agreeing to come at very short notice and producing our this presentation. You have your full 45 minutes, though we are starting late. We will end up late. Thank you. Thank you very much, Vesum. Good afternoon, and it's a great pleasure to be back in Chiang Mai and to be partnering with with uh, HelpAge again. Uh, I first collaborated, as Vesum said, uh, more than a decade ago. Uh, thank you also to the sponsors and, and all the participants. Basically, I come from a slightly different world. My world is uh, one of media and communication. Uh, I have been, as the introduction said, I've been a journalist, I've been uh, involved in trying to make sense of our, our complex world. And I've worked regionally with focus on developing countries in Asia. And this morning, Eduardo said, we will ask questions, and that's what I do for a living. I am a professional asker of questions, and I have one benefit. Uh, as a journalist, I don't always find all the answers, but that's okay. The, the art of asking questions is to formulate the right kind of questions. I think that's something we'll collectively try to do. Uh, and in doing that, I often switch between the bigger picture and the smaller detail. Uh, today, for much of my presentation, I want to remain at the bigger picture. I'll draw on one or two specific examples but I have only just two graphs in the entire presentation. And those two also are just by way of example. But I'll be showing lots of pictures. As I said, I've been here before. I've worked with uh, HelpAge, bringing journalists and broadcasters and media people from around the Asia Pacific region. This is an image from now more than 10 years ago where we had a week-long workshop trying to sensitize, trying to open the eyes and ears of media people on issues of aging and, and older people. And, and in that process, I learned a great deal myself because I'm not a specialist in this area, like many of you are. I am a journalist and many journalists are generalists. And that's, that's why we keep switching from topic to topic and try to make reasonable sense of most of the topics we cover. So my coverage today, I'm going to look at this whole area of public perceptions and the gap between perceptions and reality. 
and often there is a gap. Sometimes a manageable gap, sometimes a huge, incredible gap. And the understanding these gaps is, is necessary in trying to find ways of, ways of bridging these gaps and responding both as, as communities and as also in policy terms. And uh, I will also touch on this, this contradiction or the conundrum that we are facing in the world today, where we have so much more information, but less and less clarity on the world we are living in. Now, is there a way out of this? I will ask that question. And, and how modern communications, which enables us to access so much information, has become a mixed blessing. I'll also touch on this whole question of perceptions, because I believe, and you, we can discuss this further on in the, in the parallel session, I think we are creatures primarily made up of our perceptions. We react to each other and to the society based on our perceptions. And there are many different factors that shape our perceptions. Depending on individuals, it will vary. The relative proportions will vary. Media, which we will look at in a bit of detail today, is one key factor, but not the only one. There are also other factors like the education system, formal and informal, like our family backgrounds, like cultural backgrounds and factors. And there is also, in today's world, a lot of advertising and spin or public relations that form our perceptions in many people's mind. Changing perceptions is possible, but it's a slow, gradual process. And people do change their perceptions over time, as they age, as they mature. Both individuals and societies change perceptions. But what we want to know is how can we strategically influence those perceptions and to perhaps accelerate perceptions in a positive direction. So, in a sense, what I want to talk about is summed up in this one image. There is a gap between perception and reality. We have to be first minding the gap, acknowledging the gap, and then find ways of slowly, gently bridging that gap. Now, mind the gap is also a key theme of the work of Hans Rosling, the Swedish public health professor that Eduardo referred to this morning and, and borrowed uh, animation. He's one of the world's top public intellectuals who actually tries to show us the world based on data, based on empirical evidence, and try to bridge the gap between perceptions, very often they are slightly off the mark or hugely off the mark, and reality. And he in fact runs a public interest website called GapMind. So in fact, I would, I would recommend you to, when you next go online, to go and look at GapMind, the website, where he has interesting charts, animations, videos, and in fact, I think we all have to be GapMinders. GapMinders and slowly Gap Bridges. We have in many of our countries and cultures uh, in Asia, we have a story. We have the story about people who are visually impaired who encountered an elephant for the first time and tried to perceive it by feeling and sensing different parts of the elephant's body. Now the thing is, each of these individuals who said something about the elephant, each one was right. And yet, nobody had the composite picture, the bigger picture. And then that is, that is something very often happens with large, complex realities and situations. It's very difficult, very challenging for people to get that bigger picture. And yet, without the bigger picture, we can go off at a completely wrong perception and idea of what we are dealing with. 
of the marked public perceptions either can presume the issue to be less critical than it really is, such as the American public's views on climate change, human-induced climate change. Sometimes perceptions can also make people imagine an issue to be more critical than it is. Now, we can discuss this if we get a chance, but I believe that there is a lot of, lot of hype about the health effects of mobile phones, a topic on which research is still being done and even, even global health bodies are saying, hold on, we don't exactly know because we haven't been using them long enough, but they have sounded caution without alarm. So, yet, when we talk to people who use mobile phones, we find that many of them actually harbor apprehensions about this. So, sometimes it can be more than what the issue really is. In both cases, it can distort or it can, uh, the distorted perceptions can lead to people being confused, people being worried. It can also distort policy and public investments. We can have entirely wrong policies based on public sentiment that is based on a fallacy or a misconception. And it can perpetuate various myths and it can also lead to, as we will look at in a minute, uh, pervasive discrimination. I'm sorry. Okay, so what I'm going to do is, just to illustrate this, I'm going to draw from a sector where I have done some work, both as a journalist communicator, but also done some public perception surveys on what people, non-specialists, non-technical, ordinary public, think of climate change or changes in their <coughs> in their weather and climate. Now, it, it shows how, how nuanced and how, how complex perception studies can be and perception management can be. For example, there is now 97% expert scientific consensus that man-made, human-made climate change is here and now, and it's happening. And yet, many surveys, particularly in the US, have found that the American public do not believe that to be the case. And so there is, there is a huge gap if you look at the percentages. Near universal consensus, near, near consensus on scientific front, but the public mind is, is confused and divided. If you look at lessons again from climate, climate communication lessons that we can learn, we know that very often based on these perceptions, the debates tend to be very noisy. And this could well be, this could well be the annual climate summit that happens towards the end of the year each year. And they've been now having it for 22 years since the climate, UN climate treaty was adopted in 1992, and they are still a long way from a real workable climate mitigation program of action. And, and that's largely driven by perceptions, of course there are other agendas at work. Then there are truly confused, a lot of truly confused people around. This man in this cartoon that appeared in a US newspaper a few years ago, represents the average television viewer, at least in his country. And he is, he is trying to follow, perhaps on PBS, perhaps on National Geographic, a documentary, a coverage on, on a related issue, to, uh, issue related to climate. Uh, and he is genuinely confused on what's going on and how one issue is linked to another. And, and this, is, this is a big, big concern. Then people, by and large, prefer to hear the easy way out. They would rather not hear, acknowledge, or discuss inconvenient truths. And that, again, is part of the problem. 
politicians very closely these days follow public opinion polls and the, and the, and the various measures of public sentiment. And rather than listen to experts, such as yourselves, such as the researchers, they would go with the, the measures of public sentiment and public opinion, leading to policy distortions. So this is not just in uh, climate change, this kind of, this kind of perception-driven phenomena can happen in all the other sectors, and that is the challenge we face in trying to in trying to bridge the gap between perception and reality. In the case of climate, here is uh, one, one attempt to, to actually try and understand what really leads to common misconceptions and fallacies to spread so quickly in these days of instant communications. That's why I said Global communications have become a mixed blessing. It's much easy today for misinformation to, to travel around the world. And to then correct it, to clarify it, is a lot harder. And, and again, the era of the soundbite, when... Thank you. Okay, we need... Uh, do we have battery? Yes, thank you. Uh, era of the soundbite uh, means messages are being compacted, distilled, and, and made into shorter and simpler versions. And a lot of distortions happen. Nuance, which previous speakers spoke about, is lost. And the result is that myths are manufactured intentionally or otherwise, and then they they're out, out there, and once released, it's very, very difficult to, to try and put them back. Aging has its own share of these distortions, these misconceptions. I'm sure you can come up with a number of more phrases and assertions that, that are actually alarmist and, and distort the reality. But this is, this is found very often even in respectable mainstream news media and, and sometimes inadvertently. Quality press, quality broadcast television also carries this sort of phrases without realizing. So there is explicit exaggeration and implicit inadvertent exaggeration. I'm going to just share a few examples, just so that it is, uh, it is from different countries, different uh, examples drawn, but from English language media I could access. Ageism is a wide phenomenon in our media, and not just in Asian media, as I will show. So this is from Nikkei, Asian Review, and these are all from the last few months, at the most 12 months. Here is another one. I will come back to this symbol in a minute because uh, I think there is, there is some rethinking we have to do about the symbol as well. Again, phrases like, phrases like aging population time bomb. I think it harps back to the, the population explosion phrase that came into use in the late 60s and 1970s and we have now we have now internalized it into our popular lexicon popular imagination and people keep using it in all sorts of contexts this report was shown earlier today by by eduardo again uh, sometimes think tanks Research organizations, development agencies also contribute to this sort of oversimplification. This is from uh, Russian television just earlier this month. Time bomb aging population may explode global economy by 2050. You know, actually, I think we should, we should perhaps really be careful about 
these metaphors that involve explosions and bombs and all this, partly because many of us are in post-conflict societies coming out of long periods of violence, conflict, and we've had enough explosions of the real kind. So these metaphors, I think we should really be very careful and if possible try and not use them. Here's a cartoon from, from China Daily. Again, generally I like cartoonists because I think they are very perceptive. They are among the finest social commentators I find in, in today's public sphere. And certainly they can't be beaten on the economy of words. But what sometimes happens is they also go by the popular sentiment and cartoons like this happen. In quality press, also sometimes, phrases are used. This is from The Economist, which I consider to be a very thoughtful, reflective media publication. The burden of aging is the headline given to this, given to this graph. The next one is again a very thoughtful, very development-friendly media outlet, The Guardian. Now the story is actually a good one. The demographic time bomb diffused. But somebody who gave the headline again used the bomb metaphor. It's so pervasive now. It's almost impossible to write a headline or an intro para uh, about demography without using these cliches. It's partly to do with the nature of news media. Particularly, news is defined in most news organizations as something out of the ordinary and typically negative. And that's something that we can complain about, we can critique, but we can't really do much about. Tends to be, tends to be also very fleeting, particularly in the in this era of 24-7 news websites and television channels, it's always on the run. Just the headlines and a little bit more. It tends to be always keeping the underlying processes and factors that shape news events and incidents. It's, as I said earlier, hooked largely on sound bites. And in that scenario, oversimplifications can happen, they do happen. But let's remember not to generalize too much because the media, the term media itself is a plural. In English, medium, media. So when we, when we talk about media, it's a very pluralistic, very diverse phenomena, phenomenon. And the perceptions uh, even more driven, not, by, not so much by the news and current affairs part of media, but by the entertainment components of media. The soap operas, the game shows, and comedies, where our stereotyping very often happens. In fact, journalists covering for news and current affairs go through a lot more rigorous training and a lot more accountability in terms of accuracy, balance, credibility. That is, that is their daily working principles. Whereas those who produce the more creative content have the creative license and are often indulging in cliches, including very often about older people and, and negative perceptions being created by the entertainment part of media. So in a sense, when we, when we talk about media, we have to remember there are these two components, news and entertainment, and also the fact that in our own countries, in our own local languages, there's a lot more colorful, often more populist kind of media. And some of these factors that we are talking about can be found very, very commonly in, in the local language, local media. But at the same time, there are good media organizations, there are very, very careful, very thoughtful, sensitive media organizations who have already got principles and ethical frameworks about covering issues with sensitivity. Not just 
aging and older people, but many, many other sectors. And I think we need to perhaps acknowledge and celebrate those exceptions to the rule. I want to say that because this is not, I'm not here criticizing media as a monolithic industry. In fact, it is very, very diverse. There is the good, the bad in between. And so we, we, need to, we need to factor that in. But what is doing, whatever the content and whatever the format is that it's leading and shaping its viewers and audiences' perceptions. I have called them the modern day Pied Pipers. We know the story from centuries ago when the Pied Piper used to take the children of Hamlin away. Well, today, not just children, but many, many grown-ups are often led by the media into various modes and, and uh, types of thinking and, and perceptions. And there is also a commercial angle to it. A lot of the Pied Piper's uh, tunes may be fully sponsored. But we can't take it on, and this is the point uh, I want to emphasize, we can't take it on directly. Because the media has the freedom of expression, media has the market freedom to produce and peddle content as long as they stay within the rules and laws of their country. So we have to peddle very carefully. We do have situations like this. This, by the way, is from the US again, where this sort of phenomenon has been happening for a long time. Media freedom and the freedom of expression means that while we can critique, while we can complain, while we can certainly point out what is not right in the media, change has to be a negotiated, gradual process. The development community, or anybody else for that matter, can't quite prescribe what the media ought to do. I've been on both sides of this discussion and debate, so I know the difficulty involved in negotiating that kind of common ground, but that is what we should aspire to do. So, if the media are our modern day Pied Pipers, how do we, how do we then perhaps work, and, and if it's too difficult to change the way of corporatized industrial media, is there another strategy? Yes, there is, and I would say work with the audiences increase this factor called media literacy. So that when people read newspapers, listen to radio, watch television, there is a little more critical consumption of what the media is giving them. That kind of thoughtful, critical consumption is often not there in, in our society. So we need to work on media literacy. And also, as we have done with some workshops in the past, uh, work with the journalists and producers themselves, trying to influence one, one content creator at a time. I would say, I would say uh, difficult as it is, media is, engaging the media is one necessary element of that, that change. We, we have seen examples of how media can be a big part of that solution various campaigns that media groups have launched on their own or in collaboration with various charities and development organizations. HelpAge, I want to come back to this image because it's something that uh, I had great fun doing together with Vesum and his colleagues uh, 10 years ago when we brought in producers and reporters from across the region. We had them not just in the, in the room, in the lecture rooms, but also visiting locations and, and actual ground level projects here in Chiang Mai, near Chiang Mai. It was a small step. Many of our participants came, I remember, with certain narrow perceptions about what, what this aging factor of aging process was all about. They thought it was just about older people being neglected, being destitute. They had they had very set ideas on how to cover issues of aging and older people. Covered 
and they brought examples of what they had done and that usually into that very narrow part of the huge spectrum of stories available to journalists. During the seven days, we hopefully managed to open up their eyes and to get them to look at the bigger picture, the demographic factors, look at the health and economic factors. We asked them to look at the need to see and go beyond stereotyping of older people and, and also how they can cover more positive stories. So one example, and I'm very uh, proud of this because she managed to, she was from the Philippines, one of our star participants who managed to get a prime time slot within weeks of our workshop for this leading television network in the Philippines. She managed to look at, look back at the year 2003 through the eyes and minds and views of older people in the Philippines. So there are different ways of bringing in those voices. It's limited only by the training and imagination of media people. More of this needs to be done, and I, I hope in your own countries and, and cultures, you will continue to engage this kind of journalist, this kind of producer, because that's in the long term the best strategy in trying to change the media one report at a time. The producers and reporters told us when they came here that their bosses are often unsympathetic to development issues per se and particularly on issues like aging. So we then, the next year, we convened uh, in Pattaya, again in Thailand, a round table of broadcast managers and the so-called gatekeepers who decide on content in the television stations we brought them together for a couple of days of engagement. And again, we had, we had two dozen participants coming from across Southeast Asia and East Asia, and very good discussion and debate. What has happened since then is that the nature of media has changed enormously. Our ecosystem, already it was, it was in rapid transition back in 2003-2004, but it has become even more complex and diversified in the 10 years since. Partly because of the rise of the web, which has given more platforms, new opportunities for public to create and share content. This wasn't so prevalent 10 years ago. Broadband internet was a new phenomenon. It has changed the way particularly young Asians produce and share Culture, uh, cultural products and media products. And also the rise of social media. It has become the dominant factor for certain demographics, particularly the younger tech-savvy ones. And it is not to be dismissed because it's here to stay. How can we engage all those young minds and not so young minds now active on social media? This is a new question that we must address. And both the conventional mainstream media and the social media, there is a lot of noise. But there is also some utility value in engaging with our own development messages and content and strategies. Now, the challenge is how. We want to discuss a bit more in the parallel session this afternoon. This is a graphic from the International Telecommunications Union, the ITU, the UN agency that tracks and chronicles the information society's rise. So according to ITU, we have, we have nearly as many mobile phone subscriptions now as there are people uh, on the planet. The coverage has certainly increased phenomenally and there is also 2.7 billion people by the end of last year regularly using the internet. And that's 40% of the world population. There are still enormous gaps. There are uncovered populations and locations, but things are changing and it is now, the new communications are no longer so new and we have to factor that in into whatever communication strategies of engagement. Here is an example. 
Uh, okay, so the social, social media is a latest wave of the web where it is all about conversations. It's not just websites producing and, and disseminating content. It's the back and forth, many, many, many conversations. And the interaction between users and the producers. And how often users are themselves producers. And it can involve any one of these elements and not just text. Here's an interesting graph just showing the web of human relationships using Facebook, the most widely used social media network. This was released a year ago. Looking at, it's a, it's a data-driven map showing, and the uh, projection isn't all that clear, but if you go online and try to find it, this used to be on Facebook founder Mark Zuckerberg's uh, homepage or Facebook page uh, a few months ago. Basically, it shows all the linkages, how different countries have different relationships with each other. And there are noticeable gaps, if you look carefully. Parts of, parts of sub-Saharan Africa is barely represented. China has a big gap because China has its own social media platforms and, in, and does not does not have Facebook access. So there are gaps, but it also shows how much we have become an engaged global family in the past 10, 15 years. But therein lies other hazards and other challenges. Global cacophony is not my, my term, but I am fond of it, because that is the danger. That is what it has become. Unless we are careful, it's like a thirsty man, thirsty woman, trying to drink water from the Niagara Falls. We can get sucked in, then just, just driven away, and we can drown in that information overload. And when, when we try to engage, how many people are out there to listen to us? This conference is being tweeted. Uh, I'm, I'm hoping that there will be enough interest, but there are so many other events also, at the same time, so many other issues and topics and so many other things that are also trending, as the word goes, in Twitter alone. And that's one of many social media platforms. How to sustain careful, thoughtful conversations in social media is a huge challenge. And increasingly, the window, the number of days or number of hours available to talk about one topic, it keeps sh shrinking. It used to be we could have a social media conversation for three days, then it became two. Now it's even less, just a few hours if you are lucky, with a hashtag, and then it gains some traction before being taken over by the next, next uh, wave. So that's the topic moments are topic moments are shrinking. Now the development community. I'm beginning to wind up now. Now, what does all this mean, this new communications reality to the development community? Development community was slow to, to take to the new media, partly because earlier the constituency, their constituency was not sufficiently using this media. That is now changed. But what has happened is, it is much harder now. 25 years ago when I started working, the average number of TV channels for the developing country, developing Asian TV viewer was 2.7 channels, taking the regional average. Today, most of our countries have dozens of channels, if not more. State domination in broadcasting has ended, or soon ending, lots of private players. So development community is uncertain where to engage with whom, and even if they do engage many of the players, the audience is hugely fragmented. So they have turned, some of them have turned, to public relations firms. The spin doctors have come into development. Even UN agencies sometimes, we find, are trying to jazz up their reports, their, their documents, and their other products. And in that process, oversimplifications and distortions happen. 
Sometimes even development agencies are using the kind of phrases like the, the aging tsunami and all these phrases that we are now asking others to be careful about. So this is part of the problem. Because everyone is looking now not even for the 15 minutes of fame, it's become 15 seconds of fame. I also think and I want to suggest that in this community you should perhaps think of another symbol because this symbol is no longer very realistic with active aging. A lot of older people don't need a stick and, and also stick is not necessarily a sign of advanced age. When I had a knee injury a few years ago, I was using a stick for a few weeks until my recovery and I had, I had no misgivings in, in walking into meetings or traveling with, with my stick. So I think we need to rethink that and, and also the need for a symbol is it should be easily recognizable, it should be culture, culturally neutral and, and it could be uh, adapted into different media. So I have been asking, running up to my presentation, I have been asking on Facebook and Twitter, my, my uh, two social media platforms that I use, what do you think could be a substitute? Well, I haven't yet come up with an answer, but one of my, one of my uh, comments was very illuminating. She said, and she's a friend, uh, a social development uh, specialist based in Kolkata, the top comment, she said, especially the need to move away from the stick supporting the man and the man supporting the woman image. So there is a double whammy. I mean, the stick is obsolete. It's no longer directly associated with, with aging. And then also this has other meanings that we'd rather do away with. Can we think of a different symbol that is universally recognizable and can replace this sign on older people or elderly people. HelpAge is actually doing pretty well by using the image without the stick. And I thought this infographic was in very, very effective without the stick. And that's what perhaps we need to, well, we need to differentiate. We need to, in the sign language, find other ways of depicting. So, a few questions, three or four questions for us to consider during the parallel session this afternoon, based on and building on what I have been saying. One is that there is no longer one mass audience. It's fragmented into, into many, many, many niche audiences. And yet, we we need to engage and use media as a useful vehicle. How do we engage? How do we, what is the best way to influence a positive change in how the media people, the media producers, media gatekeepers, managers, how they cover issues of aging and older people? So that's one question we want to, to look at. The second one is as I said at the outset, besides media, there are other factors that shape public perceptions. Education, culture, family background, and so on. And also the role played by, by the older people themselves. That gives certain messages, certain visual signs to the rest of society. So how can older people be more involved in changing societies? current negative, current mostly negative perceptions? That's another question. The third one is, in other areas of social development, we have seen changes in perception and attitude happen in our lifetimes, in the past 15, 20, 30 years. For example, in, in talking about issues and concerns of people with disability. There was a time not too long ago when handicapped was used widely, even in the development circles and certainly in other forums. Not anymore. 
What changed? How did that change happen? It's not just political correctness. I think there is, there is uh, more there. There can be lessons, generic lessons that we could draw from disability rights, the women's movement, children's rights, how they were mainstreamed, and so on. By way of winding up, I, I go back to more than 150 years when Charles Dickens said this in A Tale of Two Cities. And I think what he said for his time is also valid for our, our day in the 21st century, our time. In a sense, it is the best of times where communications is concerned at least. We have tools, platforms and channels as never before. It is also, for those very reasons, the worst of times. So there, therein lies our challenge. Challenge of engagement and slowly, incrementally influencing change. I would like to think that it is possible and as demographers say, and I borrowed this straight from uh, a de more demographic website, demographers like to say that change is slow and incremental. Well, in fact, not just in demography, even in communications, even in public perceptions, change is slow and incremental. But we have to work on it, uh, whereas in demographics, it is a process that is happening. It's a cumulative process. Here we need to be actively driving it. So that's, that's my message for you. Thank you very much. And I'll end with the thought, mind the gap. Thank you.